Hello everyone, welcome to Let's Talk. We are doing this on behalf of Bichitra, which is a beautiful collective of filmmakers. And uh, this is our special space to talk about our films, share, learn from each other, and also a safe space to, I guess, discuss uh, stuff that we are not so sure about, our vulnerabilities, and to grow from each other's experiences. So I'm here today um, with my film to talk about the impact and as well with Kaveri Kaul, who is joining us from the US. And both our films, are, I found, uh, have a very strong resonance with each other, um, not just for the fact uh, of where they're rooted, the geography, uh, but also the sort of a playful approach to maybe tackling much more serious uh, issues. So I'd like to share a little bit about myself and about my film. Uh, I'm Miriam. I'm based in Mumbai. And uh, this film actually started for me uh, when I saw a shadow of a girl on the wall in uh, Kolkata. And it had a hashtag that said missing. And uh, this shadow seemed to follow me to other cities because I saw the same shadow on walls in Mumbai and then in Bangalore. And it made me really curious as to who was this artist putting up this uh, very haunting imagery and what was the story that lay behind it. And it led me to meet her and discover her story growing up uh, beside Sonagachi, uh, her childhood home, and her work in the Sundarbans where every other home had a story of a missing girl. And it led me on a six year long journey along India's northeastern uh, borders to discover these stories and other women who are doing amazing work with uh, survivors of child sex trafficking. So that's how it went for me. And uh, I would love to hear from Kaveri because I saw her film and it's really beautiful. Uh, the from the title to the way she's treated the whole issue, a very sort of intimate personal story. So Kaveri, I'd love to hear from you as to how you got started with your story. Thanks, Miriam. This is a wonderful opportunity for us to chat further. Uh, I learned of Bichitra through Prerana Thakur Desai, and it's led to so many wonderful people among us. I loved your film, first of all. You unfold so many complicated layers in telling your story, and that's what it's about, isn't it? It's not just about good versus bad, black versus white. Um, I loved it for that reason. It really drew me into the inner life of the characters and the inner story. My film, The Bengali, has many layers too, I think. Uh, yeah. An African-American woman's grandfather was among the first South Asians in the US. I take her back to India with me in search of her family's past. And it's a journey that opens up a lost chapter about immigration and who we are in today's world. It's a chapter that came before any of us and should never have been lost. In the Bengali, I'm able to take an up-close look at East and West. You know, I think, and probably you do too from your film, that people are at the heart of any story. Absolutely. Uh, the grandfather in this case was a Bengali Muslim from a place in India where no American or African American has ever gone. She is a Christian from a family rooted in the American South. They're all strangers to each other. For me, that raises so many questions. Like, what does family mean? Who belongs? Where? And these are questions of our times. I wanted to ask you about your experience with foreign funders, maybe unfamiliar with the insideness of your story. Yeah, thank you, Kaveri. I really was touched by uh, the review you gave for the film because I think that's another commonality that both of us have kind of layered our film through uh, sort of human journeys. 
And uh, I think, like you said, it's so difficult to kind of uh, paraphrase such a concept to a funder, right? It's like so difficult to pitch an idea which is actually so nuanced in that sense. So for me, it always, all, I mean, I've been a filmmaker now for 20 years and I've been really lucky to find uh, Doc Edge, which is in Kolkata, an Asian pitching forum. And I really consider that my uh, sort of um, documentary family, if you can call it, a place where we come together every year and we kind even if I don't have a project I go there just to see the other incredible films that are being uh, in the making with this particular film uh, I think we were exploring uh, like sort of open-ended sort of strands till we actually identify the survivor whose stories we would be following so I did go for a bit of crowdfunding within uh, India itself uh, where we kind of put out a small trailer and asked family and friends to contribute and that got us past a very big sort of a bump. It's a different experience for me based in New York. Um, throughout my career it, a lot of times it's meant navigating through incredibly choppy waters. Even today here we need to keep asking what stories get told because we as Indians and Indian Americans are not as visible as we need to be. Dock Edge is fabulous. It's creating a home in India, in Kolkata uh, yes. for all filmmakers from India. And from there, we're creating a visibility for filmmakers there, filmmakers here, for all of us as a global community. You know, the best funders bring creative input to the project, good creative input. But there's so many times that funders unfamiliar with the culture, funders here at least, have expressed interest in my work, but they ask, well, certainly I would include this or that, right? something that reflects their understanding or misunderstanding of my content. In the <laughs> case of the Bengali, I was very, very lucky to get a Fulbright Fellowship because the other thing people often don't realize is that for films like mine and like yours, you need time and you need to be on the ground to spend time. You can't just show immediate results. And that helped me go back to India uh, and spend half a year, more than half a year on the ground uh, developing the project. So I do have a follow-up question because with my previous documentaries, uh, I was much more familiar with the European market because you know, my film sort of premiered at Amsterdam, which is IDFA, and then automatically it is the European broadcasters who kind of, you know, uh, bought the license and stuff like that. But with this film, I knew because it was a trafficking film, I felt like uh, instinctively like it had to go to the US because it's a huge, it's not a problem that's just in India. There's a huge problem in the US as well. And I was really keen that, you know, I break through and kind of find that, um, find the supporters within the US market. And like you, I got a, a, a Film Independent Global Media Fellowship. That, that one opening led to a lot more American funders coming on board. And I was wondering if that is important to kind of have this um, first American backing and then there's this sort of domino effect that follows. Well, you definitely need uh, the first American backing to break through in this environment. And it's just a matter of uh, hacking your way through the forest to find that first backing, the people who really do understand, who do care about your story and see its universality. But Miriam, I don't want to stop you from this discussion about money, but you know, money is the bane of our existence. <laughs> True. Can I ask you a more creative question? Definitely. I love the way you use mixed media in your film, carrying documentary into another dimension where it's not just interviews or just facts. There is a creativity to it that I love. 
So I think that has been the biggest challenge because uh, it started with imagery, right? It was the work of a photographer and an artist. So I knew that even though I'm tackling a, a really uh, serious, grim subject, she was using her imagination and creativity to kind of arrest a, a passerby and, you know, stand there and engage with the sub subject, almost provoking them to enter this shadow world in a sense and discover the real stories and I knew I had to um, in some way echo that with my film as well but not through not just by using her language but using my own language that complements the sort of uh, journey of an artist into this world of trafficking and uh, since it was about shadows I felt like if I'm to use a bit of animation, then it would be uh, shadowgraphy in that sense. And uh, it really came about, like the tipping point was really uh, the sort of challenges within the film. Because here I was shooting with a survivor. Uh, she had taken her traffickers to court. And three years into the filming, uh, she realized that there was no verdict in sight. And therefore... Uh, the case would remain sub judice and maybe I would stop filming. So she came to me with a very genuine concern and she said, you know, for me, I fought this battle, putting everything on the line. And therefore, when you show the film, even though you, I had shot it with her face, which is one of the most beautiful, expressive faces, uh, she told me that I would have to conceal her identity. And you can imagine as a filmmaker what that meant. It meant that the language of telling your story, the canvas with which you had shot with so much love, it's being taken away from you. So I had actually gone to the residency in Los Angeles, wondering whether I would go ahead with this film because I felt like it was really at that point where I would make or break it. You know, those bedtime stories that... Uh, in my case, my mom told me and it was always at night with these shadows leaping off the wall. So I do associate it with storytelling, the most ancient ways of storytelling in some ways. And I'm wondering at what point exactly that you decided that you would introduce it. Did you always know that you would have those animation elements? You know, the life of the communities in my film, especially in the late 19th, early 20th century, is incredibly underdocumented, or should I say, not really documented at all. Uh, the images I found didn't begin to capture the rich textures and the attitude I was looking for. So I was at my wit's end. Um, how do you tell this intimate personal story and keep its larger, uh, themes in mind without flattening it out. So I talked to many animators and there was one who got it right away. She understood the need for colors and detail and even an element of fancy. So I'm gonna show you a clip from my film. Here we go. My grandfather was Sheikh Mohammed Musa. This is his picture. What is your name? I am Fatima Sheikh. I'm Mohammed Mustafa Shlesham. I'm going to Fatima. My grandfather was Muslim. I've heard him spoken about as a person who was very devout. No. For Sheikh to have come into a Catholic community must have been very strange for him. Sheikh arrived at the end of the 19th century. In America, he was only welcome in the black community, like all the men from India who made New Orleans their home. They had probably never tasted coffee or eaten French bread or seen Mardi Gras parades. They wouldn't have been accustomed to the dancing in the streets. The dark-skinned foreigners told stories of a faraway land called India. They cooked food with new spices like saffron. The men had to learn the unfamiliar names around them, Alfred and Louis, Fanny and Mathilde. They found work in the bustling market on Claiborne Avenue 
and became friendly with African-American women. So I'm gonna show a clip of my uh, animation as well from the trailer. girl getting trafficked has dropped from 16 to 12. We weren't allowed to look this side. I remember sounds from here. I remember I was studying for a high secondary exam at 2 o'clock at night and I heard a blood chilling scream. I mean, intervene much. It's a big, big problem. It's so a big unless problem. that kind of coordination with immigration and the DSF and yes, the other yes. counterparts that works mm. on the issue. Yes, yes. so when did you decide that you know this is something that you would roll out with that uh, sort of impact agenda so impact is extremely important and i don't think it's a separate plan that you have to design it's part of the filmmaking process. The films like yours and mine can reach people in the US and India and worldwide. It's through an impact audience that I think you can reach audiences that may not go to film festivals or theaters. Part of that for me in this case was taking the Bengali back to the Indian village where I filmed. You know, in making this film as an Indian American, I wanted to go beyond the conventional narrative of someone from the West traveling East. That's a very one-sided story. I wanted to include how the East finds a stranger from the West in their midst. In this case, the East is the villagers. They trusted me with their story and gave so wholeheartedly to the project. From the beginning, it had an impact on them. So, uh, screening the film for them in the very dark countryside, being there outside to hear them laugh and watching them listen closely, chatting with them about the film and what it meant to them afterwards. That was an extraordinarily special experience. Let me show you some photographs. That's where one part- I would of love to, I was just gonna ask you to show me if you have any images. So here yeah. we go, let's start in the village.
Wow. So, yeah. It's, you it's know, incredible. I think we have such uh, similar stories in terms of what the spaces we've been screening as well. So for me, it was so different because, um, you know, with my other films also, I did have impact, but the impact was mainly uh, uh, with festival screening. But yeah, these grassroots screenings, right? Just the images speak for themselves that night and the projector being such a sort of a unique thing landing up over there. So yeah, I have very similar images to share. It's so important to take a film back to the people who are in it. You know, for many, many years, this was not done. The documentary filmmaker who was often outside that community completely um, yeah. would make a film and just move on. Um, in this case, I just, I've always felt you can't do that. And, you know, for me, it's always important to reach out to communities who may not know about the issues that come up in the film, as well as those who've never really thought about them or thought they needed to. And it's not about algorithms or statistics. You know, it's about listening to people's responses to the film and to each other in the audience. That's a big step towards changing people's mindset. I think one of the most unique experiences was uh, doing this cross-border collaboration. So uh, because trafficking is, you know, uh, cross-border as well, it, it uh, extends geographies in that sense. Um, in, in the residency in Los Angeles, I met another Bangladeshi filmmaker and we were given a small micro grant to come up with... Uh, you know, maybe collaborations. And we thought his film was also rooted in the Sundarbans. Oh. And mine was also rooted in the Sundarbans. So we said, you know, why aren't we showing this film on both sides of the border? So, uh, you know, every evening we had like the villagers gather. We had this sort of uh, tuk-tuk with a loudspeaker that went about the streets announcing the films that would screen that evening and it was magical the way uh, you know at, at correctly the right time people would wind up from their farm duties and their home duties and gather under this tent every night and then soon word of mouth spread and uh, I think what people asked us after the screenings is why don't we get to see these films often because these films are about us. They are our stories being shown on the screen. And so then that whole sort of experience of having carried that projector and screen and gone on a ferry and all of that seems so worthwhile. And I think the images do kind of speak for themselves. So I'm gonna show you the images from the screening. Here. Can you see? Yes. Yeah, so that's the the sort of uh, tuk-tuk with the poster we created. And that was one that was both in India and Bangladesh. And you could see the kids so sort of fascinated by the uh, the fact that there's a projector and their own shadows being cast on the screen. I thought it was such a sort of a uh, echo with what happens in my film, playing with shadows to tell stories. And then we tied up with a local musician who... Um, who's really very popular. He opened the Coke Studios Bangladesh and um, he is from the village and he had held this music festival in the village. So he really helped us to kind of, uh, Saurav Moni helped us to kind of spread the word and the fact that he was backing these film screenings got like, I think people of all age groups at the screening. And there you can see what an adventure it was for us as a filmmaking crew to kind of even reach that spot of screening. The other ones were more sort of festival screenings. So like we screened at Kerala where uh, it was wonderful to bring uh, a film from the Northeast to Kerala to a very receptive audience, I would say. And uh, then we had it in Texas. Uh, the international premiere was in Austin, Texas. And it's really spooky, Kaveri. You know, it's like the minute I reached uh, Austin, 
like the signboards in the the toilets there were like about trafficking it's like i've traveled halfway across the globe and there's this very similar story unfolding over here in austin and sure enough at the screening as well the audience said exactly that this is a story that's so rooted in india but it could very well be happening in austin because of this porous sort of border with mexico and uh, a thriving trade in uh, in child trafficking and really it brings home the universal universality of it in one sense and the fact that trafficking is this sort of a global uh, billion dollar industry i love your uh, photographs of taking the film to the village uh, villages and i think you know for one thing that's something that we can bring as bichitras to the field of filmmaking, that we take our films to places where other people might not realize they need to go. You know, on a lighter note, what I found in my film was that often when I was showing it in uh, in festivals and the standard, more conventional locations, people would come up to me and speak to me in Bengali, in English, whatever, and say, I've come to see your film, I've come to see your film. It's about us. And that's something that moved me so much because it in is fact, about it's a us. scene in your film, right, Kaveri? There's what? a there's a there's a scene in your film where you're kind of showing the film to this audience, and then someone says, you know, for all you know, one of her relatives might be in this audience. So it became sort of part of your film as well. That's right. That's right. We are us. They are us, you know. I've had people contacting me, young people who've decided to look into their own family histories, whether in India or elsewhere. And many women who realize, well, we have stories to tell. And there's a tremendous value to our stories that are passed down from generation to generation. It's your mother and her shadows who, and her stories who influenced your documentary filmmaking, our grandmother's stories, you know? And I think that's another impact, area of impact, that's really, really very, very satisfying. One more thing I would love to share, it's that the fact that we also decided beyond like the sort of grassroots screening, the festivals screenings and like the youth, we decided on the youth as well. But we decided why not show it to the the side that we sort of villainize, which is uh, the people who are in the anti-trafficking sort of spaces and people who are in law enforcement. So we actually had these very focused screenings for the border security force. We are now talking to the police training academy. Those visuals are incredible as well, where you see like camouflage men really sort of, you know, this... Uh, iconic for being macho in that sense being sort of watching this film and then the discussion that unfolds is at a whole different sort of a tone I just wanted to show you those images of the border security force as well because it's like pretty different I think yeah I'll just scroll quickly yeah so we also used art because it was like so we screened at art venues and film institutes. And uh, yeah, here you see the survivor directly talking to uh, uh, the student audience, which again, it was like a documentary moment in a sense, because she just took the mic and addressed the audience. And after that, you know, the entire student community stood up and like gave her this ovation which I think in so many ways, it's a survivor wanting acceptance and it happened right there at that moment. She was a hero in in their eyes. Yeah, there you can see it. And here's the, we went to the border between India and Bangladesh and they, they sprayed this sort of a silhouette of the missing girl. And uh, I think we left it behind also as a sort of a souvenir for them, something like a collaborative art that they had created together. Yeah, and in this particular school, we had a, a girl who we had shot, uh, Seema, uh, and she now is a journalist. So we were going back uh, four years later. So you're almost getting the ending of your film. And we had to project on a tiny little screen 
in the school room and she was saying you know i was in the film i'm a school girl just like you wearing a uniform but today i'm a journalist and you know you can can take your life into your own hands and change destiny in a sense so there she is now as a journalist so i think there's that incredible kind of going a uh, full circle as well with your that possibility to go full circle when you're doing impact i totally agree i love the fact that you've taken the film to people on all sides of the issues or themes because that's what a film can do you create a space a safe space for people to open their eyes to a different way of thinking do you have any suggestions uh, specific suggestions for people new filmmakers creating their impact campaigns so i think that we were lucky that very early in our uh, filmmaking process we had applied to a forum called good pitch and our film was selected over there and we had just begun production and um it was a time that brought a lot of conflict into the film as well because there were a lot of things that needed to be resolved but it made us resolve those issues in a sort of amicable environment supportive an environment and we also identified very early on a sort of impact strategy i think it's a luxury for a filmmaker to sit down and actually think about their impact because most often a filmmaker is wearing so many hats you're your own producer you're your own director you're getting this team together in a different geography and you know also in some ways thinking about the distribution so to be thinking about impact specifically i think we were lucky that we were in an impact forum that forced us in some ways to sit down and define what this impact would be and again we um, chose to apply to an impact forum in geneva called fifdh impact days and that really strengthened what we had uh, sort of drawn as a blueprint in good pitch uh, to kind of come up with four specific objectives with our film and it it works as a very good reference every time we see uh, either plan a screening or conclude a screening to see are we actually meet, meeting these objectives the best i could do to implement those objectives and it might be something others might want to do is to just stay in touch with the people i connected with in the very beginning and i was definitely looking at people who are open to the uh the meeting of east and west what do yes. people really think of each other what is the bewilderment of the westerner who goes there what is the what are the thoughts go running through the mind of the people in the east who haven't who aren't urban global well traveled people who've been everywhere and can say things the right way or quote unquote the right way i also wanted to address people who see ancestry without realizing the global connection and the blends that many families have become and that the roots of global citizenship go way back in a way we are all building bridges aren't we and speaking of that i was very lucky to get impact campaign support from the doris duke building bridges program oh, okay and that yeah. was very very wonderful it supported uh, the impact campaign it also recognized the value of the arts in making people laugh and cry making people think inspiring people and that we have a role to play in building those bridges so did that grant come in after you had uh, sort of begun your impact work or did, were you lucky enough to get it even before you began your impact screening it came as we had started as we get started and i was scrambling to see how are we going to take it to the next step so in our case kaveri it's like we um, premiered um, end of 2022 and impact was this whole new area for us and we kind of kept applying for these micro grants and doing these you know very small screenings and struggling to just you know make 
make ends meet in that sense. And we didn't know what we were doing. We are literally taking a screening at a time. But I think it's so paid off because uh, we applied for then the chicken and egg pictures hatched grant, which this was the first year it went global. And because we had something to prove, we actually could show that we were really serious about impact and we had gone ahead with practically no support. I think that's how we landed the Project Hatched grant. So 2023 is looking really exciting for me. And it's the first time I think for a film, I've said I am going to keep aside a year just to do impact and to you know travel with my film. I've never done it before. Amazing the parallel stories. It's been so great talking to you, Kaveri. And on that note, Miriam, uh, it was great talking with you. And I hope this is just the beginning of a conversation between us and everyone else. Thanks so much to the wonderful Bichitra Collective for making it possible. Mm -hmm.